Hello and welcome to my updated guide discussing all the best cards Brawl has to offer. This list will include cards that are generically powerful and can therefore fit into a wide range of decks. Now I would always recommend you first finish a full deck so you can actually play the game as opposed to crafting a disjointed set of cards. But you can treat this video as some sort of checklist to make sure you didn't miss any obvious cards that you still might want to include in your decks. Now I'll go over my top 10 monocolored cards, lands and artifacts, and then a top 5 for every two color pair as well. It is sometimes difficult to narrow things down, so I'll be quite generous with the honorable mentions as well. Now let's get to it. Starting with white, we have a few honorable mentions. Flowering of the White Tree is one of the better Anthem effects you can be playing, since it also protects your legends. Then you also have access to a few counter spells in White, which the opponent may not be playing around at all times. Mana Tithe as a 1 mana counter spell, and then Reprieve for 2 mana can also be pretty effective when the opponent doesn't see it coming. And then if you're playing a more controlling deck, there's a ton of sweepers to choose from. A Wrath of God and Day of Judgment at 4 mana. At 5, there's Sunfall, which exiles all creatures and leaves behind a large token, and then a farewell can also be backbreaking if it can hit various artifacts and enchantments alongside all those creatures. And then if you want a disenchant effect to cheaply deal with artifacts and enchantments, I recommend Loran of the Third Path, and then also the new Witch Enchanter, which can also be played as a land, but it does come at a slightly higher price tag at 4 mana. And then now starting with our top 10, at the bottom I have the Wandering Emperor, which will soon rotate out of standard, but is still welcome in most of my white brawl decks as a way to exile tapped creatures, give us plus one counters, and give us additional samurai tokens as well, so it's very versatile. Then there's Curse of Silence at number 9, as a very unique effect for a white deck, taxing the opponent's commander as we play it, so it will be a lot more expensive for the opponent to deploy, and then once they do, we still have the option of sacrificing the curse to draw a card. Then Solitude is also quickly arising in the ranks as a way to exile an opposing creature, and we can potentially play it for free by pitching a white card from our hand, especially good if we have some instant speed flicker effect, like maybe an Ephemerate, to re-trigger the Enter the Battlefield ability to then exile multiple creatures. And then at number 7, I've uh, grouped together some 1-mana creatures that are good at protecting your commander. Giver of Runes is probably the best one. There's also Skrelv, and then a Selfless Savior can sacrifice to make a creature indestructible. So that one also pairs quite well with Lurus as your companion, as you can maybe keep buying it back out of the graveyard. And then we have a pair of removal spells at instant speed, Get Lost and Fateful Absence. I typically prefer Get Lost as it can also hit enchantments and it's harder for the opponent to leverage the map tokens if they don't have any creatures as opposed to a clue, but these are both very useful. And Skyclave Apparition is another great way to answer opposing non-land, non-token permanents as long as their mana value is 4 or less. And then we have Esper Sentinel as one of the better one drops to start out with in the format, immediately taxing the opponent's non-creature spells. And then it also scales well with any effects that can increase its power, as it will also increase the tax. And then at number 3 we have a brand new card, Guide of Souls. Might seem like a card you only want in a life gain deck, but the ability to also pump up your creatures by spending 3 energy makes this a worthwhile inclusion in almost any white deck that runs enough creatures. And then at number 2 we have Ocelot Pride, which also pairs very nicely with a Guide of Souls, and it's kind of like the White Ragavan. If it hits the opponent, we will be able to make a 1-1 token end of turn, but also plays well with other life gain effects, so the Ocelot doesn't even need to attack to make those tokens, and at some point we'll have the City's Blessing to start doubling them and any other tokens we generate. But the undisputed number 1 in white remains Swords to Plowshares, the most efficient removal spell you can get your hands on, exiling creatures also much better than just destroying them, so there's no graveyard shenanigans, and then every now and then you can also target your own creatures if you're in need of a little bit of a life gain, which can also come up. And then in blue, the honorable mentions would just be a long list of conditional counter spells, so we can skip those and go straight to number 10, Confounding Conundrum, which is an enchantment I've started adding into more and more decks as a way to slow down opposing ramp decks, but also a great way to punish opposing fetch lands, as the opponent will have to wait to sacrifice them until our turn. 
Then at number 9 I have a pair of Delve spells, Treasure Cruise and Dig Through Time also benefit from fetch lanes filling the graveyard and are a great way to get the cards flowing. Then at Tail's End is our first counter spell on this list as a nice answer to an opposing commander and there's plenty of other legendary creatures in the format that you can hit with it as well. Then we've got Snapcaster Mage as a way to buy back all these powerful instants and sorceries. Witness Protection, on the other hand, can be a great answer to an opposing commander if it's a creature, as the opponent now has to jump through some hoops to get their original creature back. And then a Brainstorm also benefits from all the fetch lands as a way to shuffle your deck after putting some unwanted cards back. And then we've got a lot of ways to take extra turns. Time Warp is by far the best one, as it's the cheapest, and also goes to the graveyard where we can maybe get it back. Temporal Sundering requires a legendary creature or planeswalker before we can cast it, but also lets us bounce something. And then Elrond's Epiphany, not quite as powerful as it used to be, as it has been nerfed, so it doesn't immediately make the bird tokens unless we foretell it first, but can still be worthwhile if we have a deck with a lot of ramp or maybe some planeswalkers we can activate during those extra turns. And then at number 3 have grouped together a Cyclonic Rift and a River's Rebuke as powerful mass bounce effects. Cyclonic Rift is an instant and also has a flexibility of casting it for 2 mana to bounce a single thing back. River's Rebuke is a little bit cheaper if we want to get the full effect out of it. And then at number 2 I've also grouped together Mana Drain and Counterspell. One of these two is clearly better than the other, but they're still unconditional counterspells, so as long as your mana base can support double blue, they should certainly be in your deck. And then a wash away gets the number one spot as a one mana answer to an opposing commander. Doesn't matter if it's a creature or a planeswalker, this is one of the key cards to play around when the opponent keeps up a single blue mana. Then in black we have a few honorable mentions. The various necro enchantments are difficult to support outside of a monocolored deck, but in mono black these can be powerhouses as long as you have some sort of a plan to leverage all those extra cards, which is usually not too difficult. Meat Hook Massacre also gets a shout here, as it is a very powerful sweeper, but because it's been nerfed in historic and no longer gains you life when opposing creatures die, it didn't quite make the top 10, but if they ever revert it back to the original it will go up in value. And then starting out at number 10, we have Breach the Multiverse. This can be an awesome finisher, especially if your deck contains some expensive creatures and planeswalkers to get back, but it will also get something from the opponent, so hopefully the value from both graveyards is enough. Then we have a Liliana Dreadhorde General, has gone down in value recently since the format has sped up a little bit, but as a finisher it still remains an awesome card, can potentially clear multiple creatures and then start making an army of zombie tokens that also draw you extra cards when they die. At number 8 we have a new entry, Toxic Deluge, does require a bit of life payment, but is the cheapest way to clear the opponent's board no matter how large the opponent's creatures are, if you have the life to pay. And Shieldred the Apocalypse can be a nice way to recoup some of the life loss from all these powerful black spells, and also pairs well with any other card draw effects or card draw engines while punishing the opponent for doing the same. Then we've got a whole host of 2 mana removal spells. Shieldred's Edict and Bitter Triumph are now at the top of my list as they're also answers to opposing planeswalkers, but cards like Go for the Throat and Heartless Act still remain a very useful options at 2 mana. Then we have a Black Market Connection and to a lesser extent Phyrexian Arena as 3 mana card draw enchantments. Black Market Connection maybe costs a little bit more life but can also generate treasure or sometimes a shapeshifter token so these can also maybe speed up your game plan. And then we've got some 1 mana removal spells. Fatal Push by far the best one as we can easily enable Revolt by sacrificing a fetch land. And then a Cutdown still a nice insta speed answer to maybe take care of an opposing mana elf that the opponent can play on turn 1. And then Bloodsheaf's Thirst doesn't always make the cut since it's a sorcery, but we can also kick it to take care of larger creatures or planeswalkers. And then we have a Reanimate at number 3, a relatively new entry, but already making a lot of waves in various formats as a way to get back your commander even if it's a creature. Instead of sending it back to the command zone and having to cast it for a lot of mana, you can simply let it go to the graveyard and then reanimate it for 1 mana. But Reanimate gets better if you can take out opposing creatures and then cheaply get them back, or if you have some self-mill synergies to fill the graveyard as well. And then at number 2 we have all the various discard effects at 1 mana, Thoughtseize being the best one, but Duress and Inquisition of Kozilek are often played alongside it, and if you want to play alchemy cards, Mindspike is also very good. 
but at number one I have Dark Ritual, as it can lead to some very explosive starts, especially good if you can ramp out a 3 mana enchantment like Black Market Connection on turn one, which can then draw you more cards and generate more treasure to speed up your deck, but it's also very good if your commander happens to be a Planeswalker, because if you can play it a few turns out of schedule, there's going to be fewer creatures in play to pressure it, and then you're quickly going to reach the ultimate on your Planeswalker as well, while you can also maybe protect it more easily. It's an awesome card that you definitely want to have on your radar when building a black brawl deck. Then we move on to red, which admittedly doesn't have as many format defining cards as some of the other colors on this list, but an honorable mention still goes to Spiteful Banditry, which is like the red counterpart to Meat Hook Massacre, making a treasure instead of gaining and draining life. Then at number 10 there's another sweeper, Brotherhood's End, can be an answer to either creatures and planeswalkers or can also blow up artifacts with mana value 3 or less, so it's quite versatile. At number 9 I have a pair of treasure making creatures, Magda at 2 mana and Captain Lannery Storm can come down with haste and start generating treasure when it attacks, also maybe increasing its power, so both of these also play well with other treasure makers. Then we have a Bone Crusher Giant as just an individually useful card that can answer an opposing creature, and then a 4 3 afterwards that can start beating down. A Braid, another cheap removal spell that can also hit artifacts. Fury also goes up in value here as a way to maybe answer some mana elves from the opponent early on by pitching a red spell from your hand. Then we have a Planeswalker, Chandra, Torch of Defines is one of the more powerful Planeswalkers in the format, and there's a lot of ways to help cast it on turn 3, so the sooner you get in play the better, as removal to protect itself, but also a way to generate more mana or card advantage. And then a Goldspan Dragon is one of the better mana generators in red, as it can also double the mana produced by your treasures. And then at number 3 we have Fable of the Mirror Breaker, doesn't need an introduction, great way to generate additional mana, give you some card selection, and eventually the reflection can also be very powerful with any ETB effects that you might have on your creatures. And then at number 2 we have Ragavan, Nimble Pilfer. If you play this on turn 1 there's a decent chance the opponent just concedes, because if you can keep connecting with it and generating more treasure it's pretty difficult for the opponent to recover, and this gets better if you have some cheap removal spells to clear a path for it, and what better card to clear a path for Ragavan than our number 1 pick, a Lightning Bolt, 1 mana, instant speed, 3 damage to any target. There's a lot of cards that have tried to imitate it, but nothing can get close to the original. It's probably no secret that green is the best color in Brawl, since the format is mostly about ramping out powerful plays, and that's what green is all about. We do have some honorable mentions here. Once Upon a Time is a card I sometimes forget to include, since it has been banned in other formats, but if you can cast this for free, it's a great way to find your early accelerants. Flare of Cultivation, also a nice free ramp spell that pairs well with cards like the Kami and Arboreal Grazer, which can put an extra land in play and you don't really mind sacrificing those and starting out at number 10 we have Crater Hoof Behemoth, often the last card that's cast in any given game as it's one of the best finishers available. Then we have Fanatic of Aronas, a new introduction, but it's probably not going to take long for people to start using it more as it doesn't take much for this to generate 4 mana in your green decks. Then we have Utopia Sprawl, which is one of the better ways to start ramping on turn 1, but it does have the caveat that it has to enchant a forest, so it's difficult to support this in multicolor decks, so you'll often only be able to play this in a 1 or 2 color deck that has enough forests to enable it. Oracle of Moldaya is another favorite of mine, letting us play an additional land each turn, and we can play lands off the top of the deck, so an awesome value engine that plays well with all our landfall cards. Then our next card is infamous for introducing the token limit on Arena, otherwise the game would crash too often, so you can only make about 200 copies of Scoot Swarm before the game will stop you. Springheart Nantuko won't get to that token limit very often, but can also make copies of other creatures, so it can also lead to some pretty crazy board states. Then at number 5 we have the Great Henge, which is one of the better card draw engines available for green. Definitely better if you have some larger 4 and 5 powered creatures to give it a discount, and then once you get it down it can quickly draw you a lot of cards and take over. I would argue Cultivate has been going down in value recently, especially in mono green decks that now have access to Flare of Cultivation, but Cultivate still remains a great way to ramp and fix your colors in a multicolor deck that maybe doesn't have access to double green mana early. And then at number 3 we have Primeval Titan, banned in Commander but legal in Brawl, especially good with cards like Castle Garenbreak which can speed up casting it by another turn, and then once you get it going the opponent has to answer it but it might already be too late thanks to the two extra lands you searched up. 
And then at number 2 we have a whole host of landfall creatures that can generate extra mana with landfall. At 2 mana there's Lotus Cobra, at 3 mana Nissa, which can also find additional elves or elementals, and then Tireless Provisioner, leaving behind treasure tokens for the most part. And you could also include Mythweaver into this category, although I take pride in not having crafted that one yet. And then at number one we have a Delighted Halfling, which is also joined by Lenor Elves and Elvish Mystic as these one mana accelerants. Halfling making your commander uncounterable can also be quite relevant against blue decks, but these are all awesome to have in your opening hand. Now let's talk artifacts, and the honorable mentions include the Cycle of Swords, with Sword of Fire and Ice and Sword of Forge and Frontier probably being the best ones available on Arena so far. And then Winter Moon also gets a shout out here as a great way to punish greedy mana bases, especially good if you're playing a monocolor deck with mostly just basic lands. At number 10 we have a Paradox Engine, a card that's banned in Commander because turns take forever when you're going off with it, still legal in Brawl somehow. Now this is not a card you're going to play in any old deck, you do want to combine it with creatures that can tap for mana and other ramp artifacts, so you can keep untapping them as you're casting more spells to generate more mana, and then if you have some sort of card draw engine you can potentially go off and cast your entire deck. There's also some commanders that can abuse it, cards like Captain Cissé can search it up and then you can keep untapping it, and Oswald Fiddlebender can also be deadly when paired with Paradox Engine. Then at number 9 we have Mishra's Bauble, a free artifact that pairs well with fetch lands, as you can take a look at the top of your own deck, and then if you want to draw the card, then maybe play another land, if you want to shuffle it away you can now sacrifice your fetch land, and also maybe enable some graveyard synergies like Delirium, there's ways to maybe get it back out of the graveyard, so a pretty innocuous looking card, but it can enable some pretty sweet synergies. Then at number 8 I have the Cycle of Medallions, and you'll often want to play these in monocolor decks so they can give you a consistent mana discount. Then Roaming Throne can be awesome in a deck that has a certain creature type as its main theme, as you can start doubling those triggers. Also good if your commander has a powerful ETB effect that you can double with Roaming Throne. Then I've got the Celestus as one of the better 3 mana artifacts, as it can also gain you life and give you some card selection. A bit of a nightmare to keep track of in paper, but on Arena we don't have that problem. Then Swiftfoot Boots is a way to give your commander hexproof and haste as well, so if you're in the market for one of those effects the boots might fit the bill. Then there's the One Ring, which has been nerfed in Historic, so it costs one additional mana to activate, but still remains a very powerful card draw engine, even if you only have the one copy, so you can't replace the Legendary by playing another One Ring. Still a great way to draw extra cards, especially for color pairs that may not have a ton of card draw engines otherwise. Then there's a Worn Power Stone as a 3 mana artifact that gets to tap for double colorless, so it can give you a pretty big mana advantage. At number 2 we have a Mox Amber as a free artifact that can generate extra mana as long as you have a legendary creature or planeswalker in play, so at its best alongside a 1 or 2 mana commander. And then we have the cycle of 2 mana ramp artifacts spearheaded by Arcane Signet, which is by far the best one, but there's also Guardian Idol, the Iron Crag, Mindstone, Cold Steel Heart, and even the new Solar Transformer, which can all make their way into various decks that maybe don't have access to other ramp cards. Now I'll go over my top 10 land cycles and then I'll mention some individual lands as well. And some honorable mentions in the land cycle department go to the fast lands. These are fine to have in more aggressive decks, but in general I don't prioritize them if I have access to other lands instead. And then creature lands are nice to have as well, especially in the more aggressive decks once again, but if you're playing a more mid-range or control deck, you've got so many other ways to spend your mana, you can always replay your commander if it got answered, that I would generally avoid creature lands that enter the battlefield tapped later in the game, so those are also not a priority for me. Then at number 10, one of the least important cycles, but maybe still nice to have if you're playing a 3 plus color deck, are the tri lands, since these can also be fetched for, and you can also cycle them in the late game if you're flooding out a bit. Then we have the cycle of castles, especially the green and black castle will come in handy as ways to generate extra mana or draw you extra cards. Then the channel lands are gonna rotate out of standard soon, but will still remain staples in Brawl, especially the green channel land Boseju to blow up artifacts and enchantments or maybe non-basic lands, and Aiganjo to deal for damage to an attacking or blocking creature will see a lot of play. 
Then there's the pathways, which are nice to have, but you do have to choose between one of the two colors. So especially in three plus color decks, that can turn into a pretty big disadvantage. Then next up I have the pain lands, which do cost a little bit of life, but at least we get both colors. Then the Innistrad dual lands are painless, but do enter tapped in the first couple turns. Then the next rank up I would put the Surveil lands, partly because they do have the basic land types, so we can fetch for them, which is going to be a spoiler alert to our number one pick. Then at number three I have the Check lands, which play well with the Surveil lands and the Shock lands, as well as the Fetch lands, as they will make sure those enter untapped. At number two we have the Cycle of Shock lands, so untapped if we pay two life. These have both basic land types, so they're perfect with the Check lands, and they can also be fetched with our number one pick, the Fetch lands. These are a must-have Cycle of lands if you're going to be playing Brawl, as they can not only fix your colors, but they can also enable your landfall synergies. If you have a Surveil land to search for, they can give you a bit of card selection by letting you Surveil if you don't need the land to be untapped. And even in a two-color deck, these are fine to have, since you can also play off-color fetch lands, so you could play a Flooded Strand in your black-white deck, for instance, and then still maybe get a Backstreet if you want to Surveil, so those are awesome. And uh, yeah, there's not much more I can say about how good fetch lands are. Just make sure not to play an off-color fetch land that doesn't get any of your basic lands, because then it's not going to do much for you. And then a few more important individual lands worth mentioning. In Modern Horizons we got Shifting Woodland, which is awesome for green decks, Arena of Glory to give haste in your red decks, and then Phyrexian Tower has also been reprinted, a way to sacrifice a creature to generate extra mana. These are all incredibly useful in their respective colors. Nykthos, especially good in monocolored decks that can provide a lot of devotion, as it can generate additional mana for you. Then we've got two more fetch lanes, Fabled Passage and Prismatic Vista can only get basics, so they're not going to get your dual lands or tri lands, but they're still very useful to have. And then we've got Cavern of Souls, which, especially if you're playing a deck that has creatures of the same type, can make all your creatures uncounterable, but just making your commander uncounterable can be very useful. And then uh, last but not least, Command Tower, of course a freebie and a great way to fix your colors in any multicolor decks. And then now for my top 5 in every two-color pair, starting with blue-white, Dovin's Veto gets an honorable mention as a slightly better negate. At number 5 I have Reflector Mage as a creature that can bounce an opposing creature that the opponent doesn't get to replay on their following turn, especially annoying if you can flicker it a few times. Then there's a No More Lies as a powerful 2-mana counterspell, Supreme Verdict as an uncounterable sweeper for 4-mana, then there's Teferi, Hero of Dominaria, which can draw extra cards, untap two lanes, so perfect in a control deck, and can also minus if you need some removal. And then at number one, a criminally underrated card at the moment, Fractured Identity, can exile target a non-land permanent and create a token that's a copy of it, so it's like stealing the opponent's best card without the opponent being able to get it back if they somehow bounce it, so very powerful effect. Then in blue-black, we have a Notion Thief, which I didn't even know was illegal in Brawl until recently, can punish the opponent for drawing extra cards. Hostage Taker can steal opposing creatures or artifacts and then maybe replay them in time before the opponent removes it. Psychic Frog, a new addition that can maybe hit the opponent to draw us extra cards, and we can also pump it up by discarding cards or maybe even give it flying if we have a full graveyard. Sauron's Ransom is a nice instant speed card advantage card, so at its best in a more controlling blue-black deck. And then a Rusko Clockmaker, one of the more broken alchemy cards, great as a commander but also in your 99 as a way to generate extra mana and to drain the opponent as we cast non-creature spells. Then a Red Black gets to play with cut two ribbons, can first deal four damage and then cast ribbons with Aftermath out of the graveyard to maybe close out the game. Croxa, one of the many titans making this list, can make the opponent discard and can escape it later. Crucius, another very powerful alchemy card that can generate additional mana and can find powerful cards. Angrath's Rampage and Molten Collapse, versatile removal spells that can hit various permanent types, and then Call Against Command, a nice instant speed removal spell that can deal with artifacts, deal to damage, maybe make the opponent a discard or get a creature back from our graveyard, and we get to choose two of those modes. Then in red-green we start out with Roxanne Starfall Savant, which can deal 2 damage when it enters by making a Meteorite, which can then also make an additional mana for us. We've got a Ruby Daring Tracker, which can immediately tap for mana and can also later attack for a bit of damage. Goblin Anarchomancer will discount our red and green spells, so kind of like a double medallion. 
Then we have Domery and Ark of Bolas, which can generate extra mana, make our stuff uncounterable too, and can also fight, so it kind of does it all. Especially good if we can play it turn 2 off a 1 mana elf. And then Itali, Primal Conqueror, one of the better payoff cards for a red green deck if we can ramp into it, and then it can also be transformed to maybe poison the opponent to death. Then green-white is a tricky color pair, since it often ends up being either a tokens deck, an enchantment deck, or a deck that cares about plus one plus one counters, so it's difficult to find cards that fit into all of those archetypes. But at number five I have Catilda Dawnheart Prime, which can generate extra mana, shines alongside other humans that can also tap for more mana. We've got Arwen, Mortal Queen, an indestructible creature that can grant indestructible to another creature for one turn. Then we've got Buried in the Garden as a flexible removal spell that can generate an additional mana for us. Mirari's Wake can double the mana produced by our lands as well as pumping up our team. And then Avacyn's Pilgrim we only get to play if we're green-white and can provide another one mana accelerant. Then in black-white we have Taisa of the Ghost Council as another powerful alchemy card, at its best as a commander but can also be played in the 99, generating additional spirits each turn. Lingering Souls, speaking of spirits, can generate 4 spirits for 5 mana. We also don't mind discarding it as we can still flash it back, so it's quite versatile. Then Path of Peril we only get to play if we're playing black-white at least, and then can be another cheap sweeper that can be cleaved later in the game to destroy all creatures. Lotho rewards us for double spelling, so maybe not the best turn 2 play, but if we can play it turn 3 alongside another 1-drop, we start generating treasure, and if the opponent double spells we also get to make more mana. And then at number one, I've got a trifecta of removal spells. The Spark, Vanishing Verse and A Rite of Oblivion can all exile opposing permanents and all have slightly different conditions. Then in blue-red we have Flame of Anor, which is a bit conditional since to be at its best we want to control a wizard, but that's not too difficult in blue-red, and then can draw cards, deal damage or potentially destroy an artifact. Magma Opus can be used as an early ramp spell by discarding it and making a treasure. There's plenty of cards in blue-red that can get back instants and sorceries from the graveyard, and then if we ever get to cast it for 8 mana, it can also decimate the opponent's board. Invert Polarity, a powerful new counter spell that can sometimes gain control of an opposing spell, so it can be quite backbreaking. Prismari Command, another flexible command here, dealing damage, destroying artifacts, or maybe making treasures and drawing and discarding. And then Expressive Iteration, not a card you typically want to cast on turn 2, but later in the game can provide a nice bit of value. Then a black green has plenty of answers to opposing non-land permanents, although at number 5 we have Deathrite Shaman, which isn't a card I would have had on this list a while ago before we got to fetch lands, but now with so many decks playing a bunch of fetch lands, there's often going to be a land in the graveyard for Deathrite to generate extra mana, and then it can also exile creatures to gain life or non-creatures to drain the opponent. Binding can destroy an opposing non-land permanent and then get a forest. Abrupt Decay, a 2 mana removal spell for opposing a non-land permanent with mana value 3 or less, and it's also uncounterable. Glissa, a 3-3 with Death Touch, that can draw extra cards or maybe blow up enchantments if it hits the opponent. And then a Casualties of War is pretty pricey, but can be an awesome 3 for 1, 4 for 1, sometimes even a 5 for 1 if the opponent has the right card types on the battlefield. Then Red White gets a few honorable mentions with the two Tajik cards, Legion's Valor and Legion's Edge, both awesome in a more aggressive deck. Blade Historian can give our team double strike, and if you're looking for a more controlling option, a Deafening Clarion can deal 3 damage to each creature, as well as maybe giving your team a lifelink. Then at number 5 we have a Jani Nakadal Pariah, which can easily transform into a Planeswalker that can then generate more cats or deal damage if we have a red permanent out. Warleader's Call to pump up the team and deal damage as our creatures enter. Brutal Cathar we also can only play for playing at least red-white. And then a nice removal spell, if we exile the opponent's commander then they might send it back to the command zone, so then there's no drawback on the Cathar. At number 2 I have a Lightning Helix and a Rip Apart to deal 3 damage to creatures. Rip Apart can also hit artifacts and enchantments. And then at number 1, the new Flage, Titan of Fire's Fury, dealing 3 and gaining 3. And then we can also escape it out of the graveyard. So once again the fetch lands also very useful at fueling escape. And then a blue-green is probably the most popular color pair in Brawl, as the combination of generating extra mana and drawing extra cards is pretty good. At number 5 we have a Bonnie, a great curve topper that can generate value the turn it enters if we can attack right away. Tamyo we can pretty easily transform into the Planeswalker, which can also dominate a game if you can protect it. 
Then we've got a combination of Growth Spiral, Planar Genesis and Kellen, always to put an extra land in play and potentially draw an extra card. And then we've got Tatiova, Benthic Druid as another awesome landfall payoff, drawing cards and gaining life. And at number one, another Titan, Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath, also banned in various formats, but still get to enjoy it in Brawl. So yeah, that concludes my extensive list of some of the best cards in Brawl. Let me know in the comments if I missed anything obvious, and then you can reference those as well. But for now, I want to thank you for watching, hope you enjoyed, and as always, have a nice day!